We have a, an interesting group this morning, the Georgia Gang. Dick, if you'll bring up your troops. It hurts me to say that these people have been on the air for over 15 years, because I remember when they started. And uh, Dick Williams is sort of the ringmaster of this circus, and he'll moderate the program. And you see more of him usually uh, in the Atlanta Journal or South Magazine. Rick Allen has been a regular on the program since it began and started as a political reporter with the Atlanta Constitution. Then he went to CNN and got to where he was writing. He is now writing some rather good books. And it's amazing for those of us who knew him years ago because we didn't think he could write anything. <laughs> uh, and we don't know who's ghosting the books. But he's got a few of his cop copies of Atlanta Rising out here, and I can highly recommend that book. It uh, shows a great understanding of what's going on in Georgia and across the South. Jeff Dickerson's an editorial writer and a columnist for the Atlanta Journal. He brings uh, a, a bit of fact and figure to the group. He gives them some credibility as to having done their homework, which they need a lot of. And uh, he covers the landscape pretty well with the business community and what's happening in Atlanta. Bill Shipp is no stranger to our little breakfast group. Been around here and he's sort of the acknowledged dean of political writers in Georgia. And that means he's old. Uh, <laughs> many of us receive the Bill Shipp to Georgia and read Bill's columns in Marietta Daily and uh, Georgia Trend. And he says, I unfortunately though, I've been reading his stuff since he was editor of Red and Black. And, uh, <laughs> and I can tell you that some things do not improve with age at times. <laughs> but, uh, he occasionally acts as the, uh, as the conscience of this group, uh, although, and they need that. Tom Houck is absent again this year. It's not really surprising. <laughs> He, uh, he has to stop off at this time of day and get his marching orders from the mayor. And uh, <laughs> it's really a conflict in time for him to be out this early. Let's see if so, he prints that. Right. <laughs> Dick, if uh, y'all can never come back again, maybe we could have a, a meeting later in the day and, and, and get Halk out here. That's right. Uh, it would have to be later, you know, because there's not enough murine for him at this hour. <laughs> Dick. Have it. Uh, glad to be with you. We're among friends as always, and uh, uh, we look out on this room. I think we know just about everybody. I wanted to say at the outset that we had stopped at the Chattahoochee and uh, performed a sort of a ritual burial of Hauk uh, <laughs> just to see that he couldn't get across the river here. Uh, but he's actually in Washington. That is a scary thought in itself. <laughs> the fact that he might actually be meeting with Cynthia McKinney and John Lewis to discuss natural hairstyles and discrimination was a, is, a, is an absolutely terrifying thought. Um, but uh, that's where he is. I don't know about the hairstyle part. But uh, anyway, well, we're, we're glad to be here. And I don't, uh, it's going to be different, you know. How keeps you on edge? Uh, the greatest moment in the history of the Georgia gang was when Bill, Bill Shipp flung like a Frisbee a clipboard at Hauk. And we don't have it on tape, but it sailed right by his ear. And it was just a great moment. But for the rest of us, there's this constant, you have to keep talking and talk fast. And we're all going to talk slowly today because he's not here. Because when he is here, you've got to finish a thought quickly. Because he's, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, they're arguing with Tom Houck is like arguing, uh, is like trying to blow out a light bulb. So, you know, it, it, doesn't, do, it doesn't do any good. Well, um, let us. Uh, let us try to sketch, uh, I don't know what we're going to talk about. I guess we'll talk about Paul. No, I know. Let's talk about uh, Princess Di. Oh. <laughs> no, uh, I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, had enough? Thank you. Um, let's, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about politics. That'll be something new. And, uh, and I'm going to turn to Brother Ship because, uh, because he has a, an interesting and provocative view of the future vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the city of Atlanta and the metro area and the state of Georgia. Uh, which I think is, is a convenient way of looking ahead to the next, the next election cycle and the next couple. Billy? Well, I think a lot of us are looking forward, perhaps not looking forward, but we're going to, it's coming anyway, is the Atlanta mayor's race. It's, it, it's my contention that the next Atlanta mayor's race will not mean a great deal, regardless of who is elected. What will mean a great deal 
is the next statewide race and who we elect as governor and who we elect to the legislature. Uh, if we elect a Republican governor, that governor will be able to say to the city of Atlanta, for the first time we've had a governor in modern times who can say this, we're going to do as we please to fix the city of Atlanta, pardon the, uh, uh, the Marvin Arrington verb, but to fix the city of Atlanta as it needs to be fixed. Mike Bowers, who is running as a Republican for governor, says he will call Bill Campbell or whoever the next mayor is and says, shape up or we are going to shape up for you. In addition to that, the next legislature and the next governor will draw the, the shape of the reapportionment map after the 2000 census. And that is extremely important. The next census will give Georgia perhaps as many as 13 congressmen. And if you look at the projections in the population growth of the state, nearly all of it is north of I-20, and even more than that, the predominant amount of it is even north of Fulton and DeKalb County, which means you could have two or three new districts north of where we sit right now. That depends on uh, and how those districts will be configured will depend largely on what kind of legislature you have. Uh, on October 1st, when one more Republican defects in the House, you'll have 79 Republicans in the House, uh, which is within striking distance of 11 of having a majority. Even if the Republicans do not win a majority in the next election, if a Republican governor is elected, and that seems a pretty good bet now, he will have enough clout to, to change that majority uh, so that Republicans will be in control of the House and the budget function. So I say while the next Atlanta mayoral election is important and fun to watch, the real election is going to be the election of 98 statewide. You know, I don't get to say this about Jeff Dickerson, but for those of you who don't know him, uh, he just brings a, a depth of knowledge to our group and to the Journal's editorial page. He's uh, one of the few uh, lights that actually emits rays down at the Journal-Constitution. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he's always got an interesting perspective because he comes at everything from his background in economics, and he's a classic free marketeer. And uh, Jeff surprised me last week. We, we happened to be doing a gathering like this, and we were talking about the city of Atlanta. And it's my contention, as with Bill's, that the city of Atlanta is increasingly irrelevant. We just have its name, and we thank the people who gave it that name, but the rest of it doesn't matter much to us. But Jeff has a, has a pretty good take on it because he comes from a city that faced uh, many of the similar problems. Yeah, I, I came from Detroit where uh, things didn't slow down and growth didn't shift, growth stopped. It went in reverse. Uh, I, I came from a city where uh, everybody said if you live uh, uh, less than 10 mile road, which is about two miles outside the city, you're too close, you're too close to the city. And we're seeing a lot of the same sort of thing come here. I came from a town uh, where kids got killed every day and nobody cared. And we're starting to see some of that come to Atlanta. And the, th and the question is, how do we stop it? How do we, how, do, how do we stop becoming used to crime, to killing, to sprawl, to moving out farther, to get away from it all? Uh, there are a couple of areas where Atlanta becomes every day more like Detroit. There are a couple of areas where it doesn't. Uh, we still have a, a major uh, uh, department store in the city. We still have major employers in the city. Not everybody works outside the city. Uh, uh, we still have Lenox Mall. We still have Buckhead. We still have rich people in the city. <laughs> the problem is we don't have a middle class in the city. <laughs> And, and, and so what you've got in Atlanta right now is poor people who, who depend on public services and rich people who, who, who don't care uh, what the level of taxation there is because they're rich. The, the problem, the challenge for Atlanta is to attract middle class residents back into town. It's going to be a really, really tough thing for them to do. They've got to get control of education. They've got to get control of crime. They have to bring efficiency to government. It doesn't help when you've got a Sheila Martin Brown in town who's uh, uh, trading uh, free tickets, Dick, for, for uh, uh, cell phones and and And, 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 and Lord like knows that. what else. And going off to a peace messenger <laughs> conference in, in Africa when we need some, some peace messengers right here in the city of Atlanta. So we've got some serious, serious problems. Atlanta's borders, I believe, are 
artificially uh, 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 narrow. They, they need to be extended, but they're not going to come north because nobody wants them to. I called the folks down in Tri-Cities, uh, which are uh, mostly sort of black and middle class, and said, would you all like for Atlanta's borders to come here? They said, no way. They got so many problems. Let them keep their problems there. So if they want to get those people, their natural constituency, the black middle class that's moving west of Cascade Road, moving west of 285, they've got to bring some efficiency. Right now, those folks are in South Fulton County, and that's where they want to stay. They don't want to be part of the city of Atlanta. So you have to, uh, uh, you can understand, I think, a little better why maybe the folks in Sandy Springs and, 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 and Roswell and, and, and uh, other areas of North Fulton County don't want to be. We got some serious, serious challenges facing the city. All of which we are ultimately one region, and we can't ignore it. Even though 87 percent of ed Metro Atlantans live outside the city, but we've got serious problems. We got to look at them. We've got to examine them. We've got to try to begin to fix them. I think Jeff, Jeff, your position dovetails nicely with Bill's forecast of what happens if the city doesn't shape up and if the Republicans do achieve their majority. Now, one of those uh, rich taxpayers uh, in Buckhead <laughs> that Jeff says doesn't care about his tax bill is uh, Rick Allen. He cares deeply about his, his tax bill. When Jeff said that, I could hear the air being sucked out over at this end of the table. Uh, Rick always brings us an historical perspective. And uh, would you care to do that this morning, Rick, or would you like to change it up and be provocative? Take advantage of the fact that Hauk is not slobbering on your left shoulder. Well, I was going to say that. So tell us about Bob Todd. <laughs> You'll notice that in a certain Pavlovian way, we arrayed ourselves up here uh, just in the same order in which we appear on the show. And uh, we always like to sit in the same order because I've had to scotch guard the left side of all of my <laughs> suits because that's where Brother Tom sits. And, as I'm sure you were reflecting during the learned and erudite uh, remarks of, of Bill and Jeff, we really miss Tom, who is our giddy goose, and, and, and who had already have erupted somewhere. Uh, Tom always complains about coming out to Cobb County because he contends that this is uh, Dick's home turf and that Dick will be philosophically welcomed here. What Tom has never understood is that vast numbers of people uh, out in, in this congressional di district still believe that Dick is part of a liberal conspiracy <laughs> <laughs> by the newspaper to silence John Crown and take a sharp turn to the left. Uh, but uh, uh, I will confess to not being completely up to speed on Georgia politics, having, having spent the summer uh, out west in, in Montana uh, okay. gazing at moose and, and trying to catch fish. And somebody said, how do you keep up? And I said, largely, uh, by uh, America Online reading Bill Shipp's newsletter. Uh, uh, and, I mean, it struck me that uh, this summer's politics was written by uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. I mean, it was a morality <laughs> play. Uh, as near as to, while I was gone, uh, the, the leading Republican gubernatorial candidate uh, confesses to a, a decade-long uh, affair uh, and, and confesses to, to Bill Nygut, which is some new form of expiation I hadn't heard of. <laughs> and I had to think, who does he think he is, Brigham Young? <laughs> and, then, and then my friend Pierre Howard, who has been studying on statewide races since he was at the University of Georgia, is shocked, shocked to discover that his family doesn't want him to be involved in politics after all this time. <laughs> So I'm, I'm a little hard-pressed to explain exactly where the, the, the political train is going. But as to the city, yes, uh, Jeff, you, your timing was impeccable because this year the date for payment of City of Atlanta uh, property taxes was pushed back to September 15th to coincide with the date for estimated payments. It's been a great week. Now, I, I know those taxes are going to a, to a good purpose, but, but, but I, I do... I do differ considerably with, with uh, Dick and Bill about the significance of the future of the city, and I think it was interesting that you had uh, Ted Turner this week uh, making one of his disjointed but always fascinating speeches down at the Commerce Club uh, talking about his commitment to the city. And uh, Ted is, is a, a fascinating thinker. Uh, he's one of the few people I, I can think of who really has gained, I think, some wisdom and depth as, uh, as he's gotten older. 
And he has a commitment to downtown, and I think it's a good thing, because we have to be centered. When you talk about the, the, the growth going to the north of the city, uh, here's a scoop for you. The Piedmont Driving Club is now, its membership is deciding to get into golf, and the, uh, the land they're looking at for building their golf course is down near the airport off Camp Creek Parkway. I'm sure Mrs. Chambers will enjoy her tea times. Yeah. <laughs> But it's an interesting part of the world. I think the city is, 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 is going to go back to something more of, of balanced growth. But as I I'll always remind my fellow panelists, we have never once had a debate on the show about the mayor of Norcross. Uh, the city of Atlanta has tremendous uh, s symbolic significance, if not uh, economic significance. The, the population has shrunk to little more than a tenth of the overall urban area. But if there is no center there, then the center cannot hold. And uh, uh, I think that in addition to politics, that the future will be decided by economics, by people like Ted Turner and telecommunications, and, uh, and by our service industry that was, uh, our, our hospitality and convention <coughs> industry that was so vilified uh, during the Olympics, but which really employs close to 100,000 of the very uh, poor, uh, uh, working class black folks, uh, we are still trying so desperately to help elevate themselves. That is their golden opportunity for a good paycheck and uh, an avenue of advancement. So, Well, I, let, me, let me just wrap that part up by saying that, that, that I, I don't think that downtown is important anymore. I think downtown is a laboratory of social ills. Uh, city politics exist for the amusement of the rest of us. Uh, the only people that Campbell and Arrington and Sheila Martin Brown can hurt are people like Rick who still pay taxes in the city of Atlanta. Uh, for the rest of us, it's just, uh, it's just carnival, uh, you know, routine amusement on the 6 o'clock news. And I think what we have is, is the linear city. Uh, and I, and I, it's a concept that Andy Young first brought to the table. And, and I think it's, it's happening. We have a series of downtowns most of them clustered around mass transit uh, stations. You know, we have downtown, midtown, the art center, we have Buckhead. And where I now work uh, in Dunwoody is the largest employment center, Perimeter Mall, the largest employment center in the metro area. We are in yet another one, right now, we're in another one of these cities. They've been called edge cities, but I think they are Atlanta. We are a giant linear city. What we haven't figured out is how to connect them all very well. We can't get there from here uh, at certain times of the day. But I think that's where it's gone. And I think that the, those voices you hear in downtown Atlanta are children crying for attention. Uh, and they have no more significance than that. Now, the, the big mules, Coca-Cola and Delta, might argue something different. But, uh, but that's the way I look at it. Well, let's open it up to you all. Just throw it out here, because that's what we do. Uh, some would say we throw up. But you throw out to us, and, and, we'll, uh, and we'll scatter shot around where you want to go. Because we, when we get philosophical, we start to parade knowledge. And that's a dangerous thing. Nobody wants to talk about Johnny Isaacson running for governor as an independent? Rogers Wade is going to brief me on that later. Uh, Rick, seriously, this, is, this apparently is serious. You and I have, have dissed the notion, but uh, would you like to put that in historical perspective for us? Uh, the idea of Isaacson running as an independent? Or an independent Republican, perhaps, whatever that is? Well, I guess that would be the two pro-choice Republicans gathered somewhere. <laughs> It's the eternal dream. I mean, it was, uh, I, I thought if you were looking at national politics in recent days, it was, it was fascinating to watch uh, Mr. Weld goes to Washington. Uh, and <laughs> this, this great battle of titanic uh, figures of, of, you know, the, the aristocratic liberal Republican, which is a triple oxymoron, I, I'm afraid, in many quarters. Uh, going to Washington to take on that, that, that great old crustacean, Jesse Helms. I, I remember Jesse Helms back before he was in the U.S. Senate when he was on WRAL TV in, in Raleigh as a commentator, and I was working for the Daily Tar Heel, and uh, he was proof that, that TV commentators can rise to great political careers. But, uh, uh, you know, Weld was, was calling forth for an outpouring of public support and emotion for something that really just doesn't exist much in his party uh, and, and, and hasn't since Rockefeller was drummed out uh, uh, 
30 years ago. Uh, Johnny Isaacson, I think, really appeals to uh, Sam Nunn Democrats. And, you know, if, if Dick, it's borrowing an idea from you that'll never happen, but it is intriguing that if, you know, it, just as we all kind of imagine what kind of run Sam Nunn might have made for the presidency, if he could ever have captured the Democratic Party nomination, you, you, you wonder, you know, what, what, what Johnny could do if he could get the Republican nomination. Well, I, think, I think one of the interesting things that's happened in the happen. state, when I first started covering politics, there was but one party. There was no reason for a pollster to go out and say, <laughs> how do you, uh, which party do you affiliate with? There was what, what, but one party and you were a Democrat. You were either a Talmadge Democrat or an anti-Talmadge Democrat. There was no such thing as a liberal Democrat or a moderate Democrat <laughs> or a conservative Democrat. You were all Democrats. Then that began to change, and it really began to change early in the 1970s, and it really changed in 1994 when we elected, uh, what, eight Republican uh, congressmen that year, reapportionment changed, we elected six statewide uh, Republicans to office, uh, Zell Miller in the, in the next election, in, in that election, barely won re-election, and he won only re-election only by talking very much like a Republican. And I believe I'm right, and Whit Ayers is here, in some exit polls that year and last year, they found that there were not two parties in Georgia. We had not become a two-party state. We'd become a three-party state. Roughly a third of the voters said they identified themselves as Democrats, and about 43% of that were minority uh, voters. Another 43 or 40 something percent said they were Republicans and the rest said that they were independents. And I suspect now that if you took a poll you would find that roughly a third, a third, and a third. So it is not completely nuts for Isaacton to, to say I am going to run as a Republican. One, it gives him a chance to avoid a primary. As a Republican? As an independent. As an, as an independent. One, it gives him a chance to avoid a primary because he wouldn't have to go against Guy Milner and Bowers, Bowers being very well known, Milner having a lot of money, so that it would cost Isaacson a lot of money. All he has to do is get more than 30,000 names on a petition and he's on the ballot. It makes sense to me. Whether he can, whether he can win or get enough votes to get in a runoff, that's another question. How would you handicap a runoff? Uh, that's a fascinating thought. How would you, uh, say an Isaacson-Milner runoff? Off the top of your well, head. Well, an Isaacson-Milner runoff, you would assume that Isaacson would pick up much of the Democratic vote and would have at least a 50-50 chance of beating Milner. There is a theory that Milner, whose name recognition is already above 90 percent and has gotten about 42, 43 percent in the last two times he's run, is a theory that I don't necessarily subscribe to, but that's all the votes he's going to get. He's already well known and identified, and those people are going to vote for him. You know, when you talk about the changing face of politics in Georgia, one of the things that just utterly fascinates me, Bill, is not the ideology so much as the role of money. Uh, I think the modern political era in Georgia came in 1974 when, when someone was going to defeat Lester Maddox in the, in the Democratic primary runoff for governor, and whoever that was was likely to go on to success, and Burt Lance was one of the candidates. Uh, now, he and George Busby were really kind of fighting it out to see who would, who would get over that edge and get into the runoff. And, and, and Bert Lance released a statement of his personal wealth. I suspect uh, even then it was inflated, but he, he said he, uh, his net assets were three million dollars. And the, the electorate of Georgia recoiled in horror at the idea that this fat cat was going to come along and buy his way into a high political office. So Burt's candidacy effectively ended the day he put out that press release, and now you have Guy Milner come along with, with extraordinary scads of money and, and not much uh, personal background in politics, not much experience, not well uh, versed on the issues, and has come within an eyelash of statewide office twice, and no one thinks a thing of it. Uh, we barely remarked on the fact that, that Bill Campbell is assembling a war chest of two million dollars for a uh, mayor of Atlanta election. These are staggering sums of money that allow uh, politics now to be played out almost exclusively in the media. 
the old saw that to win statewide office, you, you had to not come from Atlanta unless you were Lester Maddox, uh, is now almost completely reversed. And if you're, if you're not a presence in the metropolitan Atlanta media market, uh, you can forget about it. So there have been tremendous changes in the logistics and the tactics of politics that may be as important or more important than the strategy itself. But don't be deluded into believing that money alone will carry the day. Uh, Weich Fowler had a great deal more money than Paul Coverdell in uh, 1992, and Coverdell, as you will remember, beat him. Michael Huffington, who's in California, all-time big spender of the world, whose record will probably never be broken, he was defeated. Milner, who has had more money than anybody, has been defeated twice. So uh, money Coles, is not a cure. Michael Coles, Michael Coles. And Michael Coles is another good example. Uh, I, I think that although, you're, I think Gingrich you're, outspent uh, Coles. Well, yeah, Gingrich did outspend go, uh, Coles. He had a lot of support, but uh, I, I think that you're absolutely right. Uh, money doesn't buy the election, and I think that that's that's in large part because people really are, even though they might be as they not, they may not be as attuned to politics as they once were. Witness the the. Uh, 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 the Helms uh, Weld fight, for instance, it seemed like nobody was paying any attention. Uh, they are attuned to issues. They care deeply about issues, and they want to hear people talk about issues. And so if you're not doing that, but you're just spending a lot of money in the media marketplace with getting your name out there, you may not have the kind of success that you would expect to have. You can't sell yourself like soap in this market, I don't think. To a I, point think that there are some, I think that there are some markets in the United States where that happens. Atlanta just isn't one of them. It seems that people here really are concerned about issues. They want issues that sort of resonate with their lives. And if you don't touch on those, you're not going to get that 50 plus. All right, well, let me, let me take up an issue that just fascinates me. Anytime I think I've really got a handle on Georgia politics, I, I reflect on the extraordinary success of our governor, Zell Miller, who when you really think about it, it is an ex-liberal uh, Democrat who, who came up through the, the trenches. He actually once had Tom Houck working for him, so I rest my case with that on his history. <laughs> and what, what Zell Miller e effectively has done is to apply a tax to the poorest people in the state of Georgia, uh, predominantly black, but mostly tax. poor, uh, in the form of the lottery, a tax which, if it were <coughs> involuntary, Jeff, would be considered that, not that, just regressive, that, that, but that's a false perception. Draconian. That's a false perception. And, and he has taken the proceeds of this onerous tax on the poorest and least educated and least able to pay taxes and, and used it to send the children of the middle class, most of them white, to college for free. It's, it's probably one of the most remarkable income <laughs> transfer <laughs> programs in the history of American Lester politics Maddox from the poor to the rich. <laughs> and he wonders why he's so popular and he gets mad at us when we call him a conservative. I, I don't get it. <laughs> why is that a challenge of footnote to this? A survey taken by the Georgia Lottery shows the overwhelming majority of the lottery players are white and more than half have college degrees, or at least some college. About if you stand that. It's wiped out the bug in Atlanta, Ship. It's amazing. <laughs> if you st that, that assertion that an overwhelming number of the lottery players are white, uh, it seems to me would be refuted by anyone trying to pay for gas at a convenience store anywhere near the time of the cash three drawing anywhere in the state of Georgia. But that's <laughs> the just, way you live. <laughs> just a social observation. Now, uh, Clint, wait, hold, hold your thought, Clint. I, no, I, wait, I we have to, a hand up, Dick. Let's well, I know, but I want to say something about issues here, because we, we have not mentioned our deep honor this morning in speaking to a known right-wing extremist group. Uh, and, and I, I, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think some of these known right-wing extremists like Amos and all of them are probably feeling real proud about the time the mayor decided to, uh, to uh, take, a, take them on. But the, the thing that's made Zell, Zell Miller popular is an issue, and it's education in its, in its many forms. And as I ponder the deeper meanings of Johnny Isaacson's uh, uh, thought about running as an independent, education comes to the forefront there. But the coming they, issue, I believe, is going to be crime. Texas is already cutting its education budget so it can build more prisons. I think you're going to see that same <laughs> trend here. Uh, <laughs> that, that I, I, someone told me in the city of Atlanta that crime is off the charts as the number one issue. That is also interesting in the city of Atlanta, and I think we're going to find that statewide, that the majority of the voters, the people who participate, 
are female, they're women. The second biggest segment is white men, uh, the, the smallest segment of voters in the city of Atlanta and statewide are black men. So you're going to see politicians playing more and more to crime, education second, but they're going to be playing to women's issues. And I think it's education first and crime second. Go ahead, Clint. How do we reduce government to get more money back into the, the taxpayer's pocket? We could, uh, could everybody hear Clint Day? It's uh, how do we reduce government to, to get more money back in taxpayers' pockets? I, I, I think, well, First of all, in the city of Atlanta, that's a no-brainer, right? That's pretty easy. Just take the municipal payroll and cut it about in half, and you got that covered. But I think, uh, I think statewide, uh, it, it can be done, and I think some of the new Republican statewide elected officials have given us kind of a roadmap for that, but they can't accomplish. I mean, Linda Schrenko certainly has had her battles over there with that bureaucracy, but it can't be done. Uh, I think fully until there's a little more balance of power in the legislature, one house or another or both houses, and I think those things then proceed naturally. Whit Ayers, the, the great pollster, will tell you that, that everything comes from having the governorship, everything, that un, until the reform party, if you will, which in, I guess in the case of the state of Georgia would be the Republicans, <laughs> until the reform part, well, and you know, given the history of the place, okay. uh, I know what Th you mean. Throw the right? rascals in, right? Throw Thank the you. rascals in, right. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, if the, if the thrice-wed temp talent tycoon uh, got in there, we could probably temp out all of our state jobs. That'd be a heck of an idea. <laughs> Easy on the benefits. But, I, no, I, I really think that's what it is. It's philosophical shit. Back here. I think crime is a local issue, and if you get south of Atlanta, I mean far south of Atlanta, you get south of Macon, crime is not an issue there. It's economic development is the issue there, and education tied to economic development. But I think, I think crime, uh, you, you can go back and trace the social causes, you can say the welfare state and that kind of thing created the crime problem in the cities, and it probably did. But dealing with it is going to be a state and local issue. I think issue. it's a very grassroots issue. It's a simple matter of a guy sticking a gun in your face. And, uh, um, you know, it, that, that's, that's not coming from Washington, but I do think that the two questions are related. I mean, we need to devolve some of this stuff down to local levels instead of always looking to Washington for the answer, for the solution, or for the problem. Um, and, and, and when we do that, we can, there's a heck of a lot we can do to reduce government, it seems to me. There's a lot that's going on in Washington. There's still a lot that's going on in Georgia that we just don't need to be doing. Maybe we don't need to be doing muscle research. Maybe we don't need a commerce department. Maybe we don't need an education department. Maybe we don't need as many uh, federal and state employees as we had. Maybe we need more privatization like we've had in Georgia the last couple of years in the federal government uh, and in the local governments. Uh, I think that there are a myriad ways that you can go about uh, 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 reducing the, the, the size and scope of government at all levels, and I think that we have to begin at all levels. Uh, but first, you've got to get some people in, in the office who are interested in doing that. Uh, we've been uh, 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 looking at city council candidates in, in, in Atlanta, and, and it's amazing how many people say, no, I don't want privatization, and I don't want privatization because it will hurt government jobs. I mean, they just come right out and tell you that. Uh, and so that, that, that attitude there, it's prevalent, it's real, and these are people who consider themselves streamliners. I, I can't miss the I, chance I, to answer that question <coughs> myself, which is obviously if you've had a four trillion dollar war on poverty and created an entitlement mentality, it's not a far leap from, from give me your money to I'm going to take your money. And I really believe that. Uh, I think we've created an atmosphere in which lawlessness to some degree is acceptable. Well, yeah. I, I just, we've had a couple of fascinating philosophical debates about crime recently, and it's always fun to argue when results aren't known, but uh, more and more results are being known. And the, the, the mayor's race in Atlanta right now uh, has got as a leading issue uh, Bill Campbell's reluctance to, to support these quality of life, so-called broken window laws and, and Marvin Arrington's enthusiastic support of them, uh, that's been tried now. There's empirical evidence. You can look at uh, New York City in particular and some other cities where uh, a crackdown on turnstile jumping, 
uh, vandalism, graffiti, uh, all of those things, uh, actually works. Uh, and, it, and it does discourage crime. I, you know, if you had told me back when I was studying sociology at Chapel Hill in the 60s from some bearded professor that, that one day we would consider the liberal view of things to take people who are mentally impaired, uh, addicted, alcoholic, or otherwise unable to care for themselves, and turn them out of uh, institutions designed specifically to deal with them, and make them sleep on grates on the sidewalks of downtown cities, that that was liberal and compassionate, and that the conservative or cold-hearted view was that we should tax ourselves and raise money and build homes for these people and places where they could go and be looked after, I'd have thought you were crazy. But that's somehow how our, our mindset devolved. Uh, you know, it, it's insane to me to be talking about building a homeless shelters in the middle of downtown Atlanta. If you build it, they will come. But, you know, Atlanta, downtown Atlanta doesn't need to be a Tivoli garden for winos. Uh, you know, you can put these people out of sight, uh, you know, and that's not a cold-hearted view if you put them in a decent place that will, that will look after them. Uh, but there, we've, we've learned way, some of these things. We don't need to debate them anymore. Th there is one honest man in the city of Atlanta, and you should look for him. He's at the uh, 14th Street exit of the downtown connector periodically. And he, he has says, a sign that says, I will work for beer. <laughs> 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 I, I, uh, I've, I've long admired his honesty, and I always tip him generously. <laughs> well, you know, this it, buds for you, buddy. This, 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 this notion that the war on poverty caused crime, I think actually it was the war on law enforcement that caused crime. And we've, we've had a, a war on law enforcement, I think, since the 60s and the riots and all of that, and our, and our, uh, our new sensitivity to dealing with uh, uh, com communities in which there's been, shall we say, urban unrest. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's permeated every aspect of our society. I mean, you know, a guy gets arrested, he's caught red-handed, he gets arrested, but he gets off. He's back in his neighborhood in, in uh, a half a day or in a day or two. And people in that neighborhood see that and they know that and they know that they can go out and they can do the same thing and they can be back. And soon you know that everybody can and it becomes a rite of passage for, for, the, for the gang to, to, to commit that crime and to go through that process and to come back out. And if you haven't done that, if you haven't been, if you haven't committed that crime, and if you haven't gotten caught, and if you haven't gotten off, then you haven't arrived. And that's where we are, Dick. I mean, that's a serious problem. We need to be able to deal swiftly, surely, with criminals who commit crimes. And we're not doing it. We've got laws in this country that say, um, uh, you know, you can kill somebody, but, 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 but if, you, uh, if the police illegally uncover the body, we're going to throw it out. And you're not a murderer. You can go free. You can go back to your neighborhood. This is wrong. We have civil liberties for some segments of society that are uncivil. And that simply doesn't make any sense. And we need to try to figure out a way to fix it. It's interesting to see what happened to the city of Atlanta early in the 60s in the so-called Age of Enlightenment. And I think there's a lesson for the whole state there. In this time when a board of directors at the Commerce Club made all civic policy, you'll look back and see that City Hall never missed an opportunity to go for a great society, a federal grant, to bring more public housing to the city of Atlanta. If you want to find the root cause to what happened to the city of Atlanta, look back in the 60s and see how they attracted public housing. So now that Atlanta has the second highest ratio of public housing residents of any city in the country. One in uh, 10 Atlanta residents. Add to that residents. Grady Hospital, the, the biggest welfare hospital in the state, and you have a magnet for poor people, a magnet for crime, and all kinds of other problems. Well, as uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I, I just wanted to say, Bill and I have had this discussion. In fact, we had it just last week. I, I think that Atlanta is, it has been, and will always be a magnet for poor people. Uh, but even more so now that the great migration north has stopped. But you don't have to go to Detroit or Chicago anymore for opportunity. You can come to Atlanta. And guess what? People are coming to Atlanta, and in huge numbers. And they think that this is the Mecca, this is the black Mecca. And they come here, and they find that really all the city has to offer the uneducated and the unskilled is a job in the hospitality industry, cleaning the hotel room. And they get discouraged. And they get on welfare, and they have three or four babies, and you have to support them. But this is the situation. It's going to continue to be the magnet. The challenge for us. 
and for this region is what do we do with these people when we get here? Superintendent Shrinko. Bus tickets. Say, I hate uh, to point you out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Bruce Hatfield back there. But we can't even address that honestly. I, I was thinking about the controversy in the last couple of days of this professor at the University of Texas at the law school who, who made an observation that some groups don't seem to value educational attainment as much as others. That strikes me as an honest observation. And yet I suspect that by the end of the month, the guy will be out of a job, tenure or not, you know, because he tried to address a problem. We're, I, I bring up something very gingerly here, but I think Dr. Uh, Linda Schrenko knows this. Uh, we're 49th in education by SAT scores. But it's interesting to note that Georgia's white students, and I don't think that the, the big papers reported this, Georgia's white students hit the national average exactly. So it might be fair to say that we have a, an educational crisis in our lower income and poorer communities, which is what the SAT tra tracks. Uh, most and, and the Asian students, income. by the way, were about 6% ahead. Yeah. And so, it's interesting. That was an eye opener to me that the, our white students hit the national average. Well, and so we and, don't have a crisis. And there, and we have a crisis could, of black there, students. There actually could be an historical reason for that. I can't recall any time in the history of Georgia where it was illegal for white kids to learn how to read. Well, and that's right. Well, I know. And there I'm was for that. black kids <laughs> well, to no, learn how I to read. Right. And so you know there, we've got some problems there that we got to deal with. And 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 uh, the cultural. Uh, 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 stigma of education, of getting out, working in the fields. You know, you can't spend your time in book learning because that's not where it is. You got to get out there and you got to work. We need to start to beat that back and that takes generations. And we're working on those generations. I mean, it wasn't all that long ago that we didn't want a kindergarten in Georgia because we didn't want to educate black kids. We didn't want to spend the money on black kids in kindergarten. And so we didn't do it. Now we've got preschool. And so I think that it's going to begin to make some uh, difference over time, but it's going to take some time. One more, wait, wait, one more dimension to what Bruce <laughs> said, though. It is not all education. South Carolina got BMW. Alabama got Mercedes because they gave away the store. Yeah. If you want to give away the store, you can probably get a lot more. But I mean, they gave, they gave what seems to me was unconscionable tax breaks to those sure. industries to move there. Uh, the people in Alabama will tell you it was well worth it because they're going to make up to it. The people in Georgia will tell you it's not worth it. One more question here. Yes, sir. Oh, hey, John, how are you? Your latest missive was intelligent as always. I'm so pleased that there's a discussion on education. On Friday, the latest... Does everyone know John Sherman, by the way? The former mayor of uh, Boca Raton, Florida, and North, North Miami Beach, whatever you were, who now, <laughs> who now, studies, who now studies urban issues as, as well as anyone I know. important, but far more important than that, is technology education. This is the key to, gain, to gaining those factors. Technology education, for example, 10 years ago, the state of Kentucky faced a similar problem of double-digit youth unemployment. And they developed, the state legislature passed the Kentucky Education Act that funds 50% of technology education in the country. The other 50% come from local school districts and business communities. I'd like to, and I, for the past 12 months, I've been asking uh, some of the legislators to introduce this type of legislation. I would like to get your views on that. I, I'd, I'd like to just jump in for a second because I, it's my contention that the public education is an extraordinarily complicated issue that 
is very different depending on where you are uh, in Georgia. But I'll begin by agreeing that, that education is, is, is vital in, in attracting these industries, although I don't think it was the decisive factor. I think SHIP is right about that. But I was fascinated to learn that in, in many industries today, to be a janitor, you've got to be able to read a, a computer printout and operate a, a computer because custodial services are now done on a computerized basis. So it's getting harder and harder to have an entry level job if you can't uh, read and write. Uh, you know, part of Atlanta's problem goes back to city housing patterns and, and Bill, it's, it's what you say but it's, it's more. You know, when we tore down uh, through urban renewal what, what a lot of black folk in Atlanta now call urban removal, we, we tore down a lot of tenements uh, with the general idea that they would be replaced with, with modern public housing, but they were replaced with the Civic Center and the stadium and other gleaming things that made Atlanta an international city. Uh, a lot of poor black people were displaced. Uh, they would have been happy to move to Cobb County, but that was back when the drawbridge was operating and they were not welcome out here. Civic leaders like John Sibley were involved in trying to disperse public housing out through the suburbs and they, they were dashed on the rocks of resistance. Uh, you left behind, therefore, a certain captive black population in Atlanta that was not doing well. Middle class black folks today are involved in black flight. Uh, they're getting out to the suburbs and, and trying to enjoy the good schools there. The schools that were left behind in the city of Atlanta were subjected to the famous Atlanta Compromise in which, in effect, the, the NAACP's lawsuit to desegregate the schools was dropped in favor of a plan to hire large numbers of black administrators and to guarantee jobs to black teachers who were not always competent. The war in the Atlanta schools today, I think, is between generations of black people. Will you sacrifice a black child's education to keep a black teacher or administrator who is not up to snuff in the job? And the answer is yes. And as long as we keep doing that, we'll keep generating generations of black kids in the Atlanta public schools who are full of self-esteem and Afrocentrism and don't know squat, and, and that's a tragedy. And, and to, wrap, to wrap that up, uh, it's fascinating facts known by few. The Atlanta public schools employ 40 more principals than they have schools. Uh, but uh, It's a nice coda, Dick. Tr true facts. We want to thank you, by the way. Uh, it's people like you who have made our broadcast a success. Our ratings are solid. Uh, we, we, uh, we dominate Fox programming on Sunday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have topped Martha Stewart uh, for several consecutive months. We Careful. thank you very much for having us. You're always a pleasure. Always good, and we hope you'll come back, and maybe if you can find Tom, bring him, drag him out here, tie him on the stage, and we'll do something with him. But it couldn't be any more entertaining than it has been, and we appreciate it very much.